Hello. Hi, Mimi. Hi, Alejandra. <laughs> How you doing? Fine, and you? I'm good. It's so great <laughs> to see you. I've missed you 20 years. I know. Too too long. <laughs> <laughs> I can't yeah. believe it's 20 years. Like that's just crazy because I feel exactly the same. I'm yeah. grayer, fatter, but I feel exactly the same. <laughs> What you sh always what counts is what how we feel, no? <laughs> I don't know. I look in the mirror. And, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> well, Mimi, so so great to see you again. Uh -oh. No, everything is We're fine. Hey, Leonard. <laughs> I hear you, Leonard. <laughs> Can you hear me, Mimi? I think Mimi had some issue with internet. But thank you everyone for being here this morning as we wait for Mimi, if she comes back. Um, for me, it has been a real honor every Sunday to be with you and to share our experience with my friends from University of Michigan. Um, uh oh, we got frozen yeah. there. It's okay, Mimi. I was I was talking to to the audience just to <laughs> let them know that <laughs> I, have, I have been enjoying so much these conversations with with all of you and and just it just my heart gets so big after the conversations. I keep like thinking about it, and it's, it's so it's so beautiful to 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 know that all of you are in my life so thank you Mimi for here this morning <laughs> and I, I, if we can we had to tell the audience that we actually lived together for we did. for one and year you, yes so i it was my first year at the university of michigan and i needed a roommate and <laughs> oh i can't remember who it was that sort of put us together but rooming with you was like the greatest thing ever because Alejandra, as you can all imagine, is, was literally friends with every single person in the School of Music. <laughs> I mean, best friends with everybody. So within two weeks of my living with you, I had met literally everyone. We <laughs> had like 11 large get togethers. There were generally people sleeping on our couches that I was, <laughs> and like, so you were a very great gateway into <laughs> becoming comfortable to, and yeah and you you showed me around ann arbor you you have remarkable energy to do everything that you did and still have a really good social life <laughs> <laughs> it's funny it's funny it's just you know it, i just had such a great time at michigan no um i i, I felt so so me and 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 that's so important to 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 feel no especially when you're when you're studying and 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 sometimes it can be so stressful too no as a young student uh, you want to do well and there's so much pressure and uh, for me it was just fantastic <laughs> Sort of my life kind of dif divides up into before michigan and after michigan because i also ended up meeting my husband there and then mm. very like i had my first child my last year of the program which is really dumb don't nobody should do that but no, <laughs> no it's not good for your life um, <laughs> but so yes yeah, so there's like a really clear line in my life and it all started there and it all just seemed especially those first years because it's like it was intellectually exciting. It was musically exciting. It was socially exciting. It was just like everything was very heightened mm. for for a couple of years there. Yeah, very intense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and Mimi, where 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 are you now? Where where do you live? I live in a town called Pennington, New Jersey, which is right outside of Princeton. Mm -hmm. And I know it's New Jersey, so you would think it's horrible but it's actually really beautiful. We live like on the edge of a nature preserve and it like, you might think you were in Vermont or something like that. Just, okay, don't go 10 miles beyond where we live because then it turns into New Jersey, but it's actually like really pretty and I like it. It's a, and it's like a little town, but what's cool about it is you feel, it feels almost rural, 
but you, know, you can get to New York City in just over an hour. You can get to Philadelphia in just under an hour. Um, that sort of means though that for anything I'm playing, I'm always driving an hour, which sort of stinks. But um, but you know, it, it's kind of fun because you you have access to big places. Yeah. Sometimes, like I live, I live in an apartment uh, in the middle of the city, and and especially in this time, it's just I I I miss being around trees and touching the ground. Um, we, so yeah. And, we, we hike every Sunday. We go and there's says beautiful hikes and we and, and it's just a thing we've done with the pandemic because and it's very, I don't know, like I do like that about it a lot. Yeah, I do too. And but Mimi, but where are you from actually? So I'm so what happened? Okay, so I stayed in Michigan. I met Leonard, my husband Leonard Kim was actually a harpsichord DMA major at the University of Michigan when I was there, and we met in an early music ensemble. But he had degrees in physics and we had this baby. Well, this is a story too. So the reason we had a baby the third year of our program, which is not recommended, I think, <laughs> is I made the mistake of talking to a very good friend of mine from high school who was, and I had just turned 30. And she was like, Mimi, if you know, if for, I knew I wanted to have kids. And she said, if you know, it's really hard that she was going through infertility and she was having IVF and she's like, if you have to have that, you need to do it early. And you know, it can be really hard to get pregnant. You can't just assume that you're gonna have a baby. So I was like, <laughs> oh no, this could, and she said it takes six months to a year. So I was like, we're finishing up our program. All right, I thought, okay, let's, we'll just try see what happens. Well, it took us like 20 minutes to get pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I mean, I, I realized intellectually that that could happen, but it just, it surprised me a little bit. So that's how we ended up having Arthur in the, the middle of our, but anyway, so Leonard took a job in physics because we needed health insurance. And it ended up that that job became more and more comfortable and a bigger and bigger job. And the thought of going back and doing a music job would have actually been such a big pay cut that it became harder and harder to leave. So now he's a medical physicist and I'm a cellist. Uh, we, live, we lived in Michigan actually for about 12 years or 11 years after our degrees, but then my sister's husband died and she had two young kids in New Jersey, which is where I'm from. So mm -hmm. I sort of started campaigning for me and Leonard to try to find work in New Jersey because I wanted to be closer to my family. So mm -hmm. now I'm about 45 minutes away from my family. Um, and- Which is and nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and Mimi, when, when did you start playing cello? Or was cello your first instrument or, or how was your, your beginnings in music? Uh, I started with clarinet and I was really bad. I never cleaned it out. So it grew mold <laughs> and it smelled really bad. So I think that was clearly a sign I was not meant to play that. And then I played piano, actually I started with piano. And then I didn't start cello until seventh grade because I had been playing clarinet in my middle school orchestra and I thought that the string players were so bad. I was like, how hard can that be? <laughs> so, <laughs> and, so I was kind of a late starter, I was 12. So I have a lot of sympathy for my older kids that come to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it actually, I mean, it doesn't, it made it harder and I'll probably never be the most athletically facile player out there because I think you do have to start really young for that but I think one good thing about being a teacher starting older is I remember I I remember learning how to play sautier I, I mean I literally remember like it was college you know when I actually so mm -hmm. I think people that are amazing and were fabulous musicians by the time they were seven they don't remember how they got there so it's a little harder sometimes to translate that into words when yeah. they teach Absolutely. I mean, <laughs> just do it. No? Yeah, right. I, it, it did happen to me too, um, in, in a way, because I, when I was, I started playing violin when I was seven. And, and it was not until when I was 12 that I had a really wonderful teacher that like made me conscious about how to do things. No, before right. it was just intuition. And, and sometimes it was not good intuition right, right, because right. There, 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 there were many things that I didn't know how to how to approach them right. so then when this teacher came and um, it just made a huge difference no um, yeah 
but I was I was 12 years old. Well, it's not it's not so old either. But no, no, but it, it made <laughs> me feel like I was playing catch up. Like I kept get I got into the best youth orchestra, but I was last chair. You know, and then I got into like a good music conservatory, but I was one of the worst. I, I mean, it took till I was a grad student to kind of, mm. to, you know what I mean? So for the first, now I sort of look back and I think actually I was pretty good. I just hadn't played for that long. But at the time I was like, I, I mean, I, I learned tenor clef, for instance, by being in youth orchestra and we were playing the last movement of Beethoven's fifth. And I didn't, I saw this thing. I'm like, well, I don't know what that is. So I just kept playing and my stand partner's like, play a string higher, play a string higher. <laughs> I'm like, why? And she's like, it's tenor clap. I'm like, what is that? So, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're still the same Mimi. <laughs> but you know, interesting for me to hear you because for me it was a little bit the opposite in, in the sense that I was, I, I was always the younger, the youngest in all the programs. Like I, 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 I finished high school here in Chile when I was 16 wow. and I moved to the States and I started my bachelor's when I was 16 and and then and then my DMA I think I started when I was 20 or 21 right. uh, but 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 now that I look back though the, if I if I had to choose I would probably I would love to do my DMA now for example right, right. <laughs> that I would probably have appreciated it more with more maturity to like really like not just pass through the program no which, right. which it was not just like that but but with more maturity to to appreciate what right. was offering to me no and also to sort of I, to figure out what I'm like now I have a clear idea what I'm good at and what I'm not good at and what I'm really interested in and then I thought I had to try to do a little bit of everything mm -hmm. and I and so some of that I think was a little bit wasted time mm -hmm. and effort. but I guess you have to kind of try everything before you figure out that so maybe maybe that's just how life is that's how it is <laughs> I wonder I wonder if it is like this for everyone maybe it is you know like until you find your 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 personality at the end uh, maybe right. has to do with that and so so you started playing clarinet then you played piano and cello and and where 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 were you when you were studying as a, as a child um in your hometown or yeah, yeah i was studying my hometown and i had i had a hysterical piano teacher she was like <laughs> 85 years old, right? But she had been a really great musician in her day. She was the, one of the first women graduates of Yale, the School of Music in like 1933 or something like that. Um, she was totally quirky. I, she had these cats that used to run through during the lesson. And you have to imagine, she's 85 years old. She weighs maybe a hundred pounds. She's this tiny little piano. She whip out a water gun and start shooting at the cats like what they were. <laughs> <laughs> wow. um, she was it was great because she let me sort of do whatever I wanted so I would try to play you know Mozart concerti and early Beethoven sonatas and like leave out a hand when I couldn't play it anymore so I had no discipline whatsoever uh -huh. uh, but it, I really loved it and I sort of think and one of the things I've done since I've you know because I have had I have three kids I've been, you know, kind of involved. I, I did four books of Suzuki training and, you know, really doing very conscious, you know, this is good pedagogy. This is, you know, you start from point A and you move to point B and you go to point C. And I, I really respect that because I've been spent, you know, 30 years of my life making up for not doing that. But mm -hmm. there's something to be said for just playing the music with any... <laughs> No, but it's, it's so interesting because again, I, I, I hear you and I think, oh gosh, that's so different than me. But now I think I wish I was more like, like this, you know, because right. I was, you know, in, in fact, Paul Cantor in one of my lessons uh, said to me, uh, how, how did he put it? Like, um, there are, he said, there, there are many good students, there, there are good students that do exactly what the teacher tells them to do and there are other students that do 
put put uh, like questions everything the teacher asked them to do and he said to me i want you to do this i want you to be the second one <laughs> you know and i and i I, and I, I, was pro, I was probably maybe 18, 19, and I, and, and, I, and I realized, you know, this, like, it's like, like, give yourself permission to, to try new things, to, to question things, to, to try your own way. And I, I, I was trained to just follow. I don't know if it was it's so strict, but, but sometimes even repeat things, no? Right. And I, and I, and I so as I hear you, it's interesting how, how different we are, no? <laughs> right. But and 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 you wish to be more, more disciplined and I wish to be more more crazy. <laughs> if that is the right. case. No? I mean you have to have a little bit of both. I think that's what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I and I did have I had a my teacher when I was young, my first cello teacher, she was um I just idolized her. She was young, she was like 30, maybe 31. She was beautiful. She had this fabulous apartment in Philadelphia that was on the very top at like 30th floor. And you had this view of the whole city. And she just, you know, she, she, she played all these really cool things. And I just was like, I want to be her. So I think I sort of fell in love with her. And that's how, because she just seemed to lead this fabulous life that I wanted. Of course, my life looks nothing like hers, although it's also fabulous, but it's nothing like that. But, but that's sort of how I, I think it's the personalities that were sort of driving for me. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so Mimi, um, you, you went to Rice University, right? I had a really messed up undergrad. I went to Oberlin. Tell me. I went to Oberlin College. Mm -hmm. um, I studied with a teacher there who was actually on sabbatical my first year. So I, the teacher, the sabbatical replacement I really liked um, and he ended up, he, his name was Dennis Brat, and he actually taught at the Conservatoire de Musique de Montréal in Montreal. So yeah. I actually followed him to Montreal. And I spent a year, my second year in Montreal and studied with him. I didn't speak any French, which was a little awkward because everything was in French. <laughs> and I'm like really bad at languages. So that was terrible. But then I, um, I got pretty homesick. I wanted to go back to a normal university setting. because So I went back to Oberlin started studying with Norman Fisher. Mm. And then Norman Fisher in the middle of the year said, guess what? I'm going to Rice University next year. So mm. I was like, okay, because I, I, I needed to have some consistency. So I followed him to Rice. So I actually attended three schools as an undergrad, which is a terrible idea. Mm. And, and that's why I, in some ways, Michigan is the school I attended the longest in terms of you know post-secondary uh, education and I feel the most attached to it because I was actually there continuously for many years. Um, and so, yeah, if any, I was going to give anybody money, it would be Michigan. And, and, and what would your parents say to you during your, your uh, undergrad? What they thought it was nuts, but there was a lot of stuff going on. Again, this, my, my, one of my sisters had been in a really bad car accident and was having to do complete rehabilitation. So I think they just wanted to know I was somewhere safe mm -hmm. and they had to focus their attentions on her. And so I was, they were like, you're going where? Where? Houston? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, yeah, it was okay. The other thing about Rice was Rice has a ton of money. So basically when, when Rice brought all these students from Oberlin over, they said, whatever Oberlin gives you, we'll give you more. So mm -hmm. financially it became easier to go to Rice. So I, I hated Rice. I know everybody loves Rice, but I was just unhappy. I didn't want to transfer. It wasn't Rice's fault, but I was just sort of mad about being there. Um, mm -hmm. I, had, I, you know, so it wasn't a fabulous experience. It was a real, and it was also, Rice is a very um, orchestrally oriented school and it's got a great orchestra program. Mm -hmm. And that's just not, um, it's not really my first love. It's not my thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I was a little bit of a fish out of water there. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then you came to University of Michigan, right? Yeah. yeah. And you studied with Anthony Elliott? I did. And he's yeah. been a great friend to me and my family. Uh -huh. so, yeah, he's a godfather of my second child. Wow. <laughs> and I used to take care of his daughters all the time. Uh -huh. Could you could you remind me? Is he still there? He just retired two years ago. Mm. 
So, and I don't know what he's going to do because all four of his children are on the West Coast. Two are in California, one is in Portland, and one is in Seattle. And I know uh, Paula Elliott, his wife, she's from Seattle. So I don't know that he's going to end up on the West Coast, but I would certainly not be surprised it, because his whole family is there. Mm -hmm. I remember him, he was such a gentleman. I, I remember running into him uh, in the hallway and he will be, he will always smile and be so, so sweet, no? What, 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 how, how, how important was him to you in terms of, of music? Hmm? Well, he, it, it, it's funny, it, he was great, but the weird, the things that were happening to me in Michigan musically in some ways were less important than all the personal things that were happening to me. And what I remember best about him, although he was an excellent musician, is that when I had Arthur, my oldest, I didn't have any money and I still had to take lessons. So he said, oh, just bring him to the lessons. Mm -hmm. So every week I brought this newborn baby to the lesson and he would hold him while I would play. Like we'd put him here and I'd have him in the stroller and he would you know, he'd be good for 20 minutes. And then of course, like any baby, he'd start to fuss. And you know, Mr. Elliott had had four kids, so he was no stranger to this. So he'd pick him up and he'd sit there rocking him and walking him around while I played. And he was so welcoming. I mean, I think a lot of teachers would have been like, yeah, get a babysitter and, <laughs> you know, yeah. but he loved it. And in fact, I think Arthur threw up on his shoulder on a number of occasions. And he was like, oh, I remember that smell. And <laughs> And 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 uh, the University of Michigan was was friendly to you in terms of being a mother, or was sort of. I mean, there was some like the I. There was some weirdness, but again, it was, you know, I sort of had to figure things out as I went along. I can't say I went out in a blaze of glory. I mean, because it's really hard. so. What happened was I had Arthur, and then this was my third year. You know. Um, I was then about nine weeks after having Arthur, I had um, basically, it was a tumor, but we thought it was, it was an ovarian cyst, but it, they said it was a tumor process that I had. So mm -hmm. I had to have emergency surgery three months after I had the baby because the thing actually ruptured mm -hmm. and it was awful. So I essentially dropped out for a semester because I couldn't have a new baby and then recover from, I had a C-section and then I had this huge abdominal surgery and then I was supposed to play a recital like three weeks later and I couldn't do it mm -hmm. um but Mr actually Paul Cantor was the chair of the department then and he sort of finagled things so I got extra financing for another semester which I couldn't have done without that and and I it was officially too late for me to drop out when all this happened but they made it happen so mm -hmm. in that regard they were fabulous because I didn't ever have to pay tuition even though I disappeared for mm -hmm. like 10 weeks, um, yeah. but then I came back and I, I mean, I'd say one of my three recitals was good and two were really pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. You're funny. And, and, and I was, I was thinking, you know, you know, the, you, the school of music of the University of Michigan is big, but not big enough. So, so it really feels like everybody knows each other. And I, I just loved that. No. Right. And, and, and we get to know each other, of course, by making music together, but at the same time, by just by sharing, you no? Know? And, and I remember many times that we used to play together, we played together. Um, if I, if, if, help me if I forget this, but uh, we, we did a lot of playing uh, together, uh, Baroque music, yeah? Yep. Yeah. It I really wanted to, because I was really taken with um, Ed Parmentier and the whole, I mean, he has an approach to early music that still has kind of really radically changed how I saw things. And I was mm. so excited by that. I started taking Baroque lessons and the school helped me get a hold of a Baroque cello while I was there. And, um, and so that's really, I thought this is what I want to do. But mm. kind of, again, life got in the way because I had these kids I didn't have a Baroque cello here. So I, I kind of have, wasn't able to follow up on that. And a few years ago, I did just for fun, I did a Baroque Institute. Um, and I, and I'm one of the teachers there helped me get a hold of an instrument. Um, so I have had a Baroque cello for the past few years and have done a few things with it. 
But mm -hmm. um, in the most recently, I've been in the string quartet in, since 2017. And that's actually been a huge thing for me. And I really kind of realized I don't have, it's too hard to go back and forth, like, because it feels really different. So mm -hmm. I've kind of let the Baroque stuff go. And I'm always a little sad about that. But, I, you know, when the kids are out of the house, maybe that'll be something I'll yeah. pursue again. But but I'm sure Leonard plays Baroque music too, not a lot or not. No, we don't have a harpsichord. So he got a, a he got his DMA in harpsichord, but then decided he didn't like the harpsichord. Mm. So now he plays the piano all the time and says harpsichord is dumb, but <laughs> but that's just Leonard being Leonard. But he doesn't. I mean, I think I could see us. You know, again, once we have kids out and through school, I could see him getting a harpsichord. I think he would enjoy that. But lately. Um, he has very eclectic music tastes. So thank goodness now he's out of the Gilbert and Sullivan period because that was really rough. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> <on a laughs> Mimi, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm very curious to, to ask. I met Leonard, in, of course, at the University of Michigan. And, and I think we, we, we did share some time together. And, and now that you tell me he, he's a physics, right? He, he yeah. how could, do you, how do you, how, how does he relate that to music? Do you talk about these things? Like about the relationship of music and physics or? The kind of physics he does is a very sort of practical physics. It's, radi it's in radiation oncology. Mm -hmm. And so they're essentially doing planning radiation treatments for people. So I don't think he's looking at the big sort of philosophical physics questions. I think when he went to school and studied physics, that was really what interested him. Mm. But this is very much for him a job. Um, mm. And he's very good at it and has been very successful. So for that, we're grateful. But he sort of, I think he likes to put that away when he comes home and we talk about music. Mm. And I, that's like, and, and then he's got really fresh eyes. He's still my, I, I love him. Um, as a critic because he's very honest. So he, he never sugarcoats things. See, I'm only nervous when he says something was amazing that I know it was really bad. <laughs> because, <laughs> because no, but if, 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 I'm sure it might, it might be so interesting to hear his point of views, but as a musician, but also as a, as a physic, I, I really, I, for me, I love physics. And, and, I, and I actually, I love quantum, quantum physics. Is that how you say it? Um, oh, yeah. It's just, it fascinates me, no? Uh, My oldest son is a uh, very, a very sciencey person too. So they've mm. had lots of, you know, deep conversations about these things. Since I am very much not a science person, I think he just shakes his head and decides that it's terrible. <laughs> 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 but Leonard is great because he sort of is a Renaissance person. He reads tremendous amounts. Um, so I, I really think I, I picked, a, a life partner well because I don't think we'll ever run out of things to talk about mm. um and that makes for a really you know he's he's my best friend and that's been really really nice great but it's that's also great, great to, to have a pianist readily available at all times I cannot wow. tell you <laughs> a couple times I've been in big trouble I've had to play a job or something and it's you know we'll play a Bach cantata on one rehearsal and it, it's you know an unholy mess in the rehearsal and I'm feeling awful about it. And Leonard will be get out open score and sit there and we'll figure it out together, which is amazing, like just to have that at my disposal. That's great. That's so. great. And um, Mimi, tell me a little bit about your string quartet. So this is fun because my the, one of the violinists in my string quartet is in string quartet is Rachel Siegel. Mm -hmm. And we, we have had this long history together because we went to the same summer music camp for a number of years, starting when I was 15 and she was 10. Um, and so we knew each other as little kids. Mm -hmm. And then we came to the University of Michigan and we played in the graduate string quartet together at the University of Michigan. And it was a wonderful quartet experience. It was with Kathy Lynn and Gregory Lee. It was a really good quartet. Mm -hmm. We played crazy stuff. We did Bartok too. We did Grossa Fuga, the Beethoven, um, you know, really hard quartets. I mean, we just like we had no fear and we played and it was a great experience. So she is here in Philadelphia now. She was in Colorado Symphony for a while, um, but she moved to Philadelphia, I think about seven years ago. And it kind of 
and not too far from when I moved here. And we would meet each other on jobs. But then um, there was a, the, the summer festival we went to at Little Kids had, has a reunion every summer. Mm -hmm. And basically, uh, everybody goes to this little place in the mountains in Pennsylvania and plays chamber music for five days, eats food like you wouldn't believe. It's essentially an eating fest with like a little bit of chamber music on the side, <laughs> and plays a concert at the end. And one of their cellists that they had regularly done it dropped out. So she called me up and said, come on, you got to come and do this. Mm -hmm. So I had... At that point, I was being a mom. I mean, I was playing, but mostly teaching. And I was a little nervous about doing this, but she sort of said, come on, you can do this, you can do this. So I did that. And we did that for a few years. And then she was in this quartet called the Fairmount String Quartet here in Philadelphia. And their cellist decided to leave. And she called me up and said, come and play with us. And the first piece, uh, I had to audition, but the first piece that we did before I auditioned actually, officially was Bartok 4, which, okay, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't been practicing regularly for 10 years. And then all of a sudden I'm trying to play Bartok 4, which is like the hardest thing I've, to this day, it's the hardest piece I've ever done. And not only did we play Bartok 4, we did it with a ballet company. So that means the tempos have to be for real because they have done all their choreography with recordings, you know, and mm -hmm. the, you can only jump so slowly, apparently. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so like that sec, anyhow, so we did that. And so it's sort of Rachel who's dragged me out of hibernation. And mm -hmm. now since we have literally been playing together, I don't know, what's, I'm 49 minus 15, that many years, um, oh. I can read her mind and she can read my mind. And and sometimes we play trios together with Leonard too. And then I really have a total mind melt because these are people I know so well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Rachel is just, she's just a wonderful quartet player. I mean, and she's, she, our quartet, all, like we do lots of weird hard stuff um, because we try to do a lot of music of women composers. Mm -hmm. um, so like we did, we did this Jennifer Higdon quartet last year, which is hard. Mm -hmm. And Rachel can like, she has antenna and she can sort of sense trouble. And when there's trouble, she just like, she just gives you a one that is the most clear, beautiful, <laughs> <laughs> like crystal one that has ever existed in the world. So. <laughs> uh, Mimi, Ani Gogova, remember yeah. her? She <laughs> says, so good to see you have never lost your sense of humor, Mimi. Cheers. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> um, I, I was uh, thinking that I, I used to play in the graduate quartet too. So with Greg, with Gregory and and Kathy. So maybe she replaced me, and then you replaced um, Catherine. Yeah. Right. Yep. <laughs> okay. It makes sense. <laughs> yep. Yep. We just followed each other right along. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's kind of a fun thing too with Katri. I've stayed really in touch with um, Katri and Vivian and a whole bunch of us that were cellists at the U of M have like a little private Facebook group um, called uh, with Erica, my favorite cellist. And we really stay in touch. And during the pandemic, we've been calling each other about every two weeks hmm. and having like a group call. And it, that's been really fun too. So yeah, the, some of these Michigan friendships are, they have staying power. That's great. <laughs> yeah, Vivian, Vivian mentioned something to me the other day when she, when she also, we had this conversation, she, she said that there's a group of cellists from the University of Michigan still meet. Yeah. That's great. That's really and great. It, and we're all like in different places and in doing different things, but um, the, the commonality is that we were all Michigan together and, and, you know, we're all sort of not the same age. I'm always the oldest, but we, mm -hmm. we're in the sort of same zone kind of <laughs> yeah Mimi uh, 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 what how do you think how how chamber music affects your life as a musician but also as a, as a human being what 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 do you think are, are like the most significant concepts about chamber music that we can take even outside of music and put it into our own lives I think for me um so I, I was having sort of a crisis of confidence, again, because I had been just sort of 
being a mom very full time. And one of the things, and I, so we would do these chamber music projects and I would be like, we're never gonna be able to do this. It just seems so overwhelming to do something like Bartok four or, you know, or um, right now we're starting Beethoven 132. But now I've sort of learned that you can take something apart very patiently and put it back together. And if you follow all the steps, it works. Like you have to like sort of believing that the end product mm -hmm. will happen. Mm -hmm. I, 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 so I, I think for me, that's just sort of seeing that the, 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 the patience to, to really dive into a work, pull it apart, mm -hmm. and then sometimes you have to do it quite, I mean, I, for me also, I've, because we'll usually have six to eight rehearsals before we do a concert, which isn't, I mean, it's a lot, but depending on the work, it's not enough ever. Mm -hmm. So I really learned how to really study on my own. And as you know, you should have learned that I probably as an undergrad, I should have learned that, but I did. It. <laughs> <laughs> so I've learned that now. And it really does sort of help me see that, you know, you see the ultimate product that you want to get to mm. and you know how to forge a path through it. And you sort of believe that you will get there, even if it seems a little overwhelming at the, at the onset. So that for me, and of course, there's always the element of um it, it's weird i don't have a lot of like neighborhood friends like or adults well nobody gets together now because of the pandemic but because my my quartet they're my friends so mm -hmm. I, I feel like i have lots of social interaction it's just it's with when we're working on these projects it's never you know what i mean it's never like let's mm -hmm. sit around i mean sometimes we get together but you know what I mean? Like my friends are the people I'm doing work with. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> and great. And 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 when you when you talk about this this like to have this image about the about the piece of the work, do you create that image together? How 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 do you do it? You know, I I I had a I listened to a great conversation uh, of the first violin of the of the Dover String Quartet mm -hmm. the other day. And he said something very interesting that it makes total sense to me that he said, you know, when we study peace, of course, we make sure that we all know the parts the best possible way, but we, 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 we allow a space for, for the piece not to be finished, you know, like in, in, the, in the rehearsal, like they allow for the piece that could totally change as, right. as, as, the, as, as the work progresses. How, 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 how does it work for, for, for your quartets? I think that's true. I think that actually when we run into trouble, it's when somebody has two, it's often we're, we're best off if none of us have played the work or haven't played the work recently, because mm -hmm. if one of us has played the work and has a really like set conception about how it's going to go, we're going to butt heads a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's better when like, um, and Leonard is very good at this when we're rehearsing too, because I like to talk, as you can probably tell, a lot. <laughs> He's like, let's just shut up and play. And <laughs> because things become clear as, as you play them and you don't have to discuss every mm. phrase. Like, I mean, sometimes you do, but you don't have to. So I do find that, yes, for me, when I say I do the homework, it really is literally understanding what the other parts are. Because I think what, like when we used, when I was at the University of Michigan, I would know my part, but I was a little vague on what was going on in the other parts. Mm -hmm. So that's when like true disasters can happen, right? Like somebody like skips a beat <laughs> and you're like, oh. but now I'm at a stage of life where knock on wood, relatively few disasters happen in performance. Because even if somebody does something weird, we know each other's part so we can uh, you know adjust um i think when we were at school though we didn't have time i mean now i'm probably learning four programs a year well not this year because this year's weird but in a normal year i'm learning four programs a year mm -hmm. um i mean it's it's not that much though it's like it's kind of perfect and we play each of them twice so it's maybe and then we'll do like four other little concerts like a library concert so it's probably like 12 concerts a year which means i have something I'm working on all the time, but it's never so much that I'm under a pile of music and can't breathe, which sometimes felt like that in grad school when you're doing your solo repertoire and the quartet stuff and, it, yeah. you know. 
very intense. Yeah. <laughs> so now it's nice. I have a project going all, it's like right, the right speed for me because mm -hmm. I, I, I always have something to practice, but very rarely am I panicked. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, occasionally, <laughs> oh, but. <laughs> Mimi, um, I know you also uh, 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 teach, no? Yes, tell a me, lot. Tell me, tell me about that and, and, and how, how does have changed during this pandemic and what have you done in order to, to still be inspiring? <laughs> I do teach a lot and I've been teaching actually all, all the way through, even when I was not playing as much, I was still teaching a lot. Um, I, I take anybody like if they can hold the instrument, I'll take them. So I, I do not, because I sort of like having students in all sort of developmental stages. It's less boring that way. So I, I right now I have a child or a, a young adult. He's 18 who's playing Dvorak concerto, and I'm like frantically trying to like learn it before he comes to your before actually it's online now because I'm like crap. I haven't played this in 25 years, mm. and <laughs> you know. So I'm like if I have to demonstrate something, I'm in trouble. So I have kids like that. And then I have, you know, little tiny kids who were learning how to do the bow hold. And I find that refreshing. I have found the tiny kids are really hard during the pandemic because I didn't realize how much I would physically manipulate the kids. So you just grab their hand and you put the fingers where they need to be. And you, you know, mm -hmm. you, and now you can't do any of that. I'm mostly teaching online. And as I was telling you before, when we were talking with little kids, if even to say, let's start at measure 15, that's assuming that they know what a measure is mm. and, <laughs> and that they know that the beginning numbers of the line that they have to count. And then mm. you say, start the quarter note pickup, that's assuming they know what a quarter note. So everything is 45 steps that used to be one when I could just point. Mm. Um, but I think I think I'm I'm fairly successful as a teacher. Um, I mean, most of my students like it, and I think that's sort of the main goal. And if some of them really like it and get serious, then I know enough to sort of help them get on the path to you know to to do you know in summer things and you know good the good youth orchestras around here. And if some of the kids really just want me to chat with them and play duets with them for forty five minutes, that's fine too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think so too. No, I, I, I feel that sometimes what is the most important is just to be inspiring by, by learning an instrument, and and uh, and when the moment comes, they will get more serious about it. Right, no? and it's funny I've seen that happen. Like kids that I like, I seriously taught them the same lesson forty five times in a row, and I was like, you know, just cruise control and then something sparks their imagination and then all of a sudden they take off and you don't know when that's going to happen yeah. so you don't I very rarely give up on a kid I, I can think of maybe two in like 20 years that I was said you know what I don't think this is working but mm. I mean that's pretty rare because mm. you know as long as they're nice I don't mind <laughs> I'm not okay <laughs> I, I do not really, I, for cello, I, I don't love online lessons because I think most people come to the cello because of the sound, because mm. it's such a beautiful sound. And you know, that's so limited when we're working through screens, like the, the overtones, you don't hear them really. And it's hard. And I think kids don't have necessarily, unless they come from musical families, they don't have a concept of sound. Mm. And so, you know, you're the best example that they have as a teacher. And if they can't really hear it, mm. so I, I, sometimes with the weather being better in the fall here, I have been teaching a little bit in person and just sitting 10 feet away and opening all the windows and making them wear masks and hoping for the best. But as it gets colder, I think we're gonna have to go fully back online. Mm -hmm. But I'm very much hoping that, you know, by summer, we can have something resembling a normal thing again. <laughs> Mimi, you have three kids, right? And the I three do. of them play instrument. They do. That's, and, that's pretty, I have to say that that's pretty amazing, no? Uh, like, I, I, it's amazing how during these times in general, uh, uh, it's not easy for, for, for um, young musicians to, to stay 
in an instrument, no? And and I and I, I'm I'm curious to know that how how it is for you because you are a musician too. Do you do you tell them go? On, it's time for you to go and practice, or they do it themselves? How how does well, it work? <laughs> for, we started everybody with string instruments. So I Arthur. Um, is a really good cellist, actually. Um, in fact, he's got kind of a Leonard brain in terms of sort of putting things together. And I go to him for fingerings all the time because I was playing um, for, for Tango, the Piazzolla, and there's mm -hmm. this really nasty passage in it. And I could not come up with a fingering that wasn't stupid. And I spent a really long time at it, and I was like, Arthur, come here. And he, I swear that kid looked at it for two minutes. He's like, yeah, put four here. And he was right. And I was like, <laughs> but so he's, uh, pretty self-motivated, pretty advanced. Stephen, uh, Stephen, my son that plays the flute, he's our middle child, was one, he had played violin for a while, didn't really love it, chose the flute and we were like, okay, we don't know anything. But in a way that was good because we don't know anything. So I literally, I don't know, I mean, the flute's totally weird. It's like a different planet than a string mm -hmm. instrument, right? So, um, and he was a kid that kind of didn't do anything for a couple of years. And just in the, really since the pandemic has started really practicing hard. And mm -hmm. I think he's grown like five years in the past five months. So that's been amazing to hear. And it wasn't really us. It was just the switch came on for him. Mm -hmm. And he, so, and then Lizzie plays oboe, which again, I don't know Jack about. So I, I think she had, she and I had, I had taught her cello and she was doing quite well, but she just hated me as a teacher. Like she was, <laughs> <laughs> like she had no, wanted no part of that. So she came up with oboe and Leonard and I were like, really oboe? Oh, okay. And of course she loves it. And mm. again, I don't know. I mean, I, I do scream at her, okay, go practice for 30 minutes, but it's not particularly more, you know, uh, sophisticated than that. Leonard accompanies everybody. And of course, when they do that, which is great because then they realize that their rhythm is terrible and then they can correct, you know, because mm -hmm. so, but beyond that, we're kind of hands off. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, none of our kids want to, I don't think, I mean, Lizzie maybe because she's only 11, but I, my two older ones, I don't think want to pursue music professionally, mm -hmm. um, but they're both pretty serious amateurs. So it's fun. Great. Right. And 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 um, the cellist, what, what was his name? Arthur. Arthur, Arthur. Does he play with you? Does uh, he yeah. study? But I mean, I mean, does he study with you? He does. And uh, it's that has actually kind of worked. I don't know. It's not it's not like we get along necessarily better in real life. It's, it's when you have a teaching relationship, it's really very specific to the teaching relationship. Mm -hmm. So he and I worked as a teacher and student and I've been teaching him now for eight or nine years and mm -hmm. we've really been comfortable in that role um and partly because I liked for instance you know with another student I might say hmm that didn't work so well can we analyze you know why that didn't work and with Stephen he's like I mean with Arthur he's like that sounded like shit and I'm like yeah so let's figure out why it sounded like shit. and then we just kind of laugh and it's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more relaxed because <laughs> but um i mean he wants to be a chemist he wants to go into chemistry um but he really is playing like he played uh chopin polonaise brilliant that was amazing he, mm -hmm. he it's funny he has like more athleticism at the cello than i do mm -hmm. so like his octaves are better than mine which is a little annoying because he doesn't <laughs> Mimi, you're funny. Becky Ansel says, Mimi, you're hilarious. <laughs> hey, Becky. Becky's another one that I live, you know, close to Becky and that I've been playing with since we were tiny. And yeah, our lives just keep looping in and out of each other's. <laughs> Mimi, um, how, how, how do you feel that music um, relates with, with uh, with your kids, what, 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 what do you think are the tools that your kids are, are receiving by, by playing an instrument? I mean, when they're little, it definitely helps them break apart. I think for my whole teaching idea is what I was saying about quartet, it's taking a large problem, breaking it into solvable components and then putting things back together. And I think that's a skill 
for anything in life that you want to do is the ability to kind of take a huge thing and break it into little chunks that you can manage. So they're good with that. I, I do think it's fun. Um, they all love music. They all love music in their own way. They all sing all the time. Um, they all listen to music. Uh, Arthur wakes up every morning. His alarm is uh, Beethoven 7 opening. <laughs> so every morning I wake up to Beethoven 7. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so I think it's been like part, and Leonard is always playing piano. So there is always music kind of, it's just in the background of their lives, but it's, it's definitely something I think they will love. And they, you know, I mean, Lizzie has like terrible taste in pop music and loves all that stuff too. And we totally embrace that and blast it in the car. And Stephen went through an intense Leonard Cohen phase last year where he learned every word to every song and mm -hmm. tried. And so they, they all like sort of attach themselves to music. Arthur is funny because I was telling you, I really don't love orchestral playing. He loves orchestral music. That's what he loves. That's what he listens to all the time. He wants to play in an orchestra in college. He's like, yeah, chamber music doesn't do it for him, but orchestral music is what really excites him. So we're all, but they all love music. Yeah. And I think um, the reason I'm, I'm I, I asking you this is because um, we can we can realize or not, but to to have the opportunity to to learn an instrument, um, and I'm talking maybe from from my part from here in Chile, no. Um, it's really, it's a privilege not to right. have the opportunity to first to have a, your own instrument and then to have the opportunity to play the instrument, no? And, and, and sometimes, I mean, I'm for, it happened for me for sure that sometimes I take things for granted because they're so normal to me, so natural, no? Right. But, but then when, I, at least in my own experience, when when I have been teaching and, and, and violin and and with so many different kids, no, and I realized how important music can be in their lives, just just by 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 having a sense of identity, no, um, or, or, or this feeling that I'm I'm being seen, no, because I'm playing right. an instrument. It's so beautiful, no, and and. And, and 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 so that is that I was curious to 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 see if if, if your kids realize about this because probably they are so so immersed in music that they don't realize. Well, you, you know? grew up. Isn't um, your dad a bass player? Yeah, yeah. So you grew up sort of. It's always in the part of your life from as long as you could remember, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And and for me, music is 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 um is is a it's an agent for transformation, not to, to transform human human lives. I mean, this is so strong. I believe this so strongly that that uh, um, probably mo most of my projects or all of my projects have to do with this, no? Um, and and I just I just feel that it's so it's so we're so lucky, you no, know, to be part of the musical world, whatever it means, no, right. for for each of us. Um, Mimi, Katri says, I knew this would be entertaining. Much <laughs> love to you both. <laughs> I got and, and actually we have four minutes to, to go and, and before the, the hour is finished. And, and, and like I said to everyone, I'm, I'm so happy to, to reconnect with you, uh, Mimi, again. Um, I have all these images of us together sharing, sharing life. I I have one very funny image, although this is not uh -oh. honoring for either of us. But do you remember we played a concert with a singer? And uh, I don't know, it was something Baroque. It was Handel or Telemann or something. And she forgot to take the decapo or something like that. Or she <laughs> said, and one of us went on, one of us went back. And there it was, you and I were, it was just like harpsichord, you, me, and the singer or something like that. <laughs> And it was complete chaos. 
I don't, and then like we, you, you were like such a good musician. You were just kind of playing along with her harmonies, like hoping for the best. And I was totally lost. And then we both, like we get backstage afterwards and we both ran out the door. Do you remember that? We like, <laughs> we, like fled the scene of the accident. <laughs> I don't think it was either of our faults, but it was very fun. That was one of the funnier. <laughs> oh. Yeah. But we also did some beautiful things too. I oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I have images of us playing in that, um, where the harpsichord was. What was the name of that? Bam? Room? Something, yeah, that room. It was like a basement kind of thing. Yeah. And I remember playing the Bach B minor sonata with you. Uh huh. That's and what it was. Really beautiful. Like yeah. that was, that was, I actually played that again this year with Rachel and it all brought back to me like playing it together with you. I was like, oh, the last time I played this, I, that slow movement, the D major slow movement is one of my favorite uh -huh. Bach movements, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mimi, it's so, it's so great to, to, to see you again, to, to laugh again. Um, yeah, it's so nice to see you. I wish. It's like, true, you're very hilarious. <laughs> Still. I just, it's funny how the pandemic has, I think because we all have more time, I've been in touch with more people than, you know, because before there's never time and now we got time. So it's really nice. I'm so glad that you are taking the time to do this to kind of pull everybody in. Yeah. What a cool idea. It's interesting because when the, the idea came to me, um, I, I wrote to Katri, you not know, to see, do you think this would my work? And she said, of course, just do it, no? And then I had to, to think about the name of the conversations, but it was something that I wanted to do a long time ago. Um, it, it's because my, my times at the University of Michigan were really, really special. And, and I have to say that once in a while, um, I, I think, wow, it's, it's so different here because I mean, I, 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 do think, I do things professionally as a conductor and, and as a violinist, but it's interesting that I don't have my friends that I used to play with. You know? <laughs> so this one part of me that, that have, has no connection musically, you know? and, I, and I always wanted to, to create something special that could connect these two worlds and hope, hoping that this will be the first step to maybe something incredible that we don't even know yet. Exactly. <laughs> that, so, I love that about music because you, you do find that, like you, you run into these people again and again at different times of life and you just, your lives end up weaving together. It, it, it's funny how that works. Yeah, and, and, and it's interesting to me that the way it, at least it works with me is that I listen to all of you and immediately I have images of something that I would love to do, no? <laughs> and it can happen to with each one of you. And, and so I, I, what I actually do is I, I write them down after the meeting. So, so then hopefully the, the idea will start moving and, and, and who knows, maybe we might do something together in the future. I would love that. <laughs> Justin Bruns puts little hearts. Aww. And Tom Lanschuk says, hi, Mimi. Hi, Tom. <laughs> There's a play. So, so Mimi, thank you again uh, for being here this morning. For, for us, it's a very special day today because here in Chile, we have a, a plebiscite to vote for a new constitution today. So it's a big, big day for us today and um, hoping for the best of, of my country. So, yeah. so thank you for, for being in this special day here with, with all of us. <laughs> Well, thank you, and thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Mimi. And <laughs> let's keep connected, and, and, and thank you, everyone, for being here with, with us uh, this morning, and, and i see you next Sunday. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.